Good day everyone. For today, we will be talking about George Berkeley, David Hume, and David Hartley. Let us first start with George Berkeley. George Berkeley was born on March 12, 1685 in Kilkenny, Ireland. He first attended Kilkenny College, then in 1700s, at the age of 15, he entered Trinity College, which is the University of Dublin, where he earned his bachelor's degree in 1704 at the age of 19 and his master's degree in 1707 at the age of 22. He received ordination as a deacon of the Anglican Church at the age of 24, and also when he was 24, he published an essay towards a new theory of vision, and a year later, he published what was perhaps his most important work, a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge. His third work, major work, Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philonus, was published during his first trip in England in 1713. Berkeley's fame was firmly established by these three books before he was 30 years old. He continued on at Trinity College and uh, lectured in divinity and Greek philosophy until 1724 when he became involved in the founding of a new college in Bermuda intended for both native and white colonial Americans. In 1728, he sailed to Newport, Rhode Island, where he waited for funding for his project. The hoped for government grants were not forthcoming, however, and Berkeley returned to London. Berkeley's home in Whitehall, near Newport, still stands as a museum containing artifacts of his visits to colonial America. For the last 18 years of his life, Berkeley was an Anglican bishop of Cloyne in County Cork, Ireland. He died suddenly on January 14, 1754 at Oxford, where he had been helping his son enroll as an undergraduate. Just over a hundred years later, the site of the first University of California campus was named for Bishop Berkeley. Now let us move to George Berkeley's opposition to materialism. Berkeley observed that the downfall of scholasticism caused by attacks on Aristotle's philosophy had resulted in widespread religious skepticism, if not actual atheism. He also noted that the new philosophy of materialism was further deteriorating the foundation of religious belief. While at Trinity College, Berkeley studied the works of such individuals as Descartes, Hobbes, Locke, and Newton, and he held these individuals responsible for the dissemination of materialistic philosophy. The worldview created by the materialistic philosophy was uh, that all matter is atomic or corpuscular in nature, or minute in nature, and that all physical events could be explained in terms of mechanical law. That was how Berkeley felt. The world becomes nothing but matter in motion, and the motion of moving objects is explained by natural laws, which are expressible in mathematical terms. Berkeley correctly perceived that materialistic philosophy was pub was pushing God farther and farther out of the picture, and thus it was dangerous, if not potentially fatal, to both religion and morality. Berkeley therefore decided to attack materialism at its very foundation, its assumption that the matter exists. Okay, therefore, one of the main goals of Berkeley's philosophy was to combat what he regarded as a major obstacle in religion, which is matter. To be is to be perceived. Berkeley's solution to the problem was bold and sweeping. He attempted to demonstrate that matter does not exist and that all claims made by materialistic philosophy must therefore be false. In Berkeley's denial of matter, he both agreed and disagreed with Locke. He agreed with Locke that the human knowledge is based only on ideas. However, Berkeley strongly disagreed with Locke's contention that all ideas are derived from interactions with the empirical world. Even if there were such a world, Berkeley said, we could never know it directly. All things come into existence when they are perceived, and therefore, Reality consists of our perceptions and nothing more. Only secondary qualities exist. 
In his discussion of primary and secondary qualities, Berkeley referred to the former as the supposed attributes of physical things and to the latter as ideas or perceptions. Having made this distinction, he then rejected the existence of primary qualities. For him, only secondary qualities or the perceptions exist. This, of course, follows from his contention that to be is to be perceived. Berkeley argued that materialism could be rejected because there was no physical world. Berkeley did not deny the existence of external reality. Of course, Berkeley's contention that everything that exists is a perception raises several questions. For example, if reality is only a matter of perception, does reality cease to exist when one is not perceiving it? And on what basis can it be assumed that the reality of one person uh, that the one that the reality one person perceives is the same reality that the other perceives? First, we must realize that Berkeley did not deny the existence of external reality. What he did deny was the external reality uh, consisted of inert matter. What creates reality is God's perception. It is the fact that external reality is God's perception that makes it stable over time and the same for everyone. The so-called laws of nature are uh, ideas in God's mind. On rare occasions, God, has, has, uh, God may change his mind and thus vary the laws of nature, creating miracles, but most of the time, his perceptions remain the same. What we experience through our senses, then, are the ideas uh, in God's mind. With experience, the ideas in our minds come to resemble those in God's mind, in which, uh, in which case, it is said that we are accurately perceiving external reality. To be is to be perceived. And God perceives the physical world, thus giving it existence. We perceive God's perceptions, thus giving those perceptions life in our minds as ideas. If secondary qualities are understood as ideas whose existence depends on a perceiver, then all reality consists of secondary qualities. Principle of Association According to Berkeley, each sense modality furnishes a different and separate type of information or idea about an object. It is only through experience that we learn that certain ideas are always associated with specific objects. By sight, let's take for example, someone have the idea of light and colors with their several degrees and variations. By touch, an individual may perceive hard and soft heat and cold, motion and resistance, and all of this more or less either as a quantity or degree. Smelling furnishes uh, someone with odors, the palate with taste, and hearing conveys sounds of the mind in all their variety of tone and composition. And as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they become, or they come to be marked as one, by, uh, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. Thus, for example, a certain color, taste, smell, figure, and consistency, having been observed to go together are accounted one distinct thing, signified by uh, the name apple. Other collections of ideas constitute a stone, a tree, a book, and the uh, like sensible things, which as they are pleasing or disagreeable, excite the passions of love, hatred, joy, grief, and so forth. Thus, the objects we name are aggregates of sensations that typically accompany each other. Like uh, Locke, Berkeley accepted the law of uh, contiguity as his associative uh, principle. Unlike Locke, however, he did not focus on uh, fortuitous or arbitrary associations. For Berkeley, all sensations that are consistently experienced together become associated. In fact, for Berkeley, objects were aggregates of sensations and uh, nothing more. Now let us move to Berkeley's theory of distance perception. Berkeley agreed with Locke that if a person who was born blind was later able to see or 
he or she would not be able to distinguish a cube from a triangle. Such discrimination requires the association of visual and tactile experiences. Berkeley went further by saying that such a person would also be incapable of perceiving distance. The reason is the same. For the, for the distance of an object to be judged properly, many sensations must be associated. For example, when viewing an object, the person receives tactile stimulation while walking into it. While walking into it. After several such experiences from the same and from the different distances, the visual characteristics of an object alone suggests its distance. That is, when the, when the object is small, it suggests great distance. Thus, um, and when uh, large, it suggests a short distance. Thus, the cues for distance are learned through the process of association. Also, stimulation from uh, other sense modalities become a cue of become a cue for uh, distance for the same reason. Berkeley gave the following example. So we have uh, sitting in my uh, study. I hear a coach drive along the street. I look through the casement and see it. I walk out and enter into it. Thus, common speech would incline one to think I heard, saw, and touched the same thing to wit. The coach. It is uh, nevertheless uh, certain the uh, ideas intrumited by each sense are widely different and distinct from each other, but having been observed constantly to go together. They are spoken as, of as one and the same thing. By the variation of the noise, I perceive the different distances of the coach and that it approaches uh, before I look out. Thus, by the ear, I perceive distance just after the same manner as I do by the eye. With this empirical theory of distance perception, Berkeley was uh, refuting the theory held by Descartes and others that distance perception was based on the geometric of uh, optics. According to the latter theory, a triangle is formed with the distance between the two eyes as, it, as its base and the object fixated on as its apex. The distance objects uh, or a distant object forms a long narrow triangle and a nearby objects form a short broad broad triangle. So also the apex angle of the triangle will vary directly with the distance of the ad object attended to. So the greater the distance, the greater the apex triangle, the apex angle, and vice versa. The convergence and divergence of uh, the eyes are important to this theory, but only because it is uh, such movement of the eyes that creates the geometry of distance perception. According to Berkeley, the problem with the uh, theory of distance perception based on natural geometry is that uh, people simply do not perceive distance in that way. The convergence and divergence of the eyes were extremely important in Berkeley's analysis, but not because of the visual angles that such movements, uh, that such movement created. Rather, they uh, were mo they were important because the sensations caused by the convergence and divergence of the eyes became associated with other sensations that became cues for distance. Okay, and first, it is uh, certain by experience that when we look at a near object with both eyes according, according as it uh, approaches or recedes from us, we alter the disposition of our eyes by lessening or widening the interval between the pupils. And this disposition or turn of the eyes is attended with a sensation which seems to me to be that which in uh, this case brings the idea of greater or lesser distance into the mind. The analysis of the perception of uh, magnitude or the size is the same as for distance perception. In fact, the meaning that uh, any word has determined uh, has is uh, determined by the sensations that typically accompany that world. We have already seen this in the case of Apple. So, Berkeley gave another example as well. So, as we distance, so our, as we see distance, so we see magnitude. 
And we see both in the same way that we see shame or anger in the looks of a man. Those passions are themselves invisible. They are never they less left uh, they are never they less let in by the eye along with colors and alterations of countenance which are the immediate object of vision and which signify them for no other reason than barely because they have been observed to accompany them without which experience we should no more have taken blushing for a sign of shame or gladness Berkeley's empirical account of perception and meaning was a milestone in psychology's uh, history because it, sh it showed all uh, complex perceptions could be understood as uh, compounds of elementary sensations such as the sight, the hearing, and touch. So, uh, Atherton, okay, 1990, provides a more detailed account of Berkeley's theory of perception and the justification of referring to it as a revolutionary okay so that is that's it for george berkeley now let us move to david hume david hume was born on april 26 1711 in edinburgh scotland david hume was educated at the university of edinburgh where he studied law and commerce but left without a degree Given relative freedom by an inheritance, he moved to La Fleche in uh, France, where Descartes had studied as a young man. It was at La Fleche that uh, Hume, and before the age of 28, wrote his most famous work, Treatise of Human Nature, being an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. The first volume of which was uh, published in 1739 and the, and the second volume in uh, 1740. About uh, his treaty, Hume, ha Hume said it fell dead born from the press without reaching such a distinction as even to excite a murmur among the zealots. In uh, 1742, Hume published his philosophical essay, which was well uh, Received. Hume was always con convinced that his treatise was poorly received because of its manner of presentation rather than its content. And in 1748, he published an abbreviated version of the treatise titled An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Much of what follows is based on the posthumous 1777 edition of the Inquiry. Unlike uh, many of the other philosophers of his time, Hume was never a university professor. He was nominated for an academy for an academic position twice, but the the opposition of the Scottish clergy denied him uh, the post. Hume was skeptical of most religious beliefs and friction, and the church was constant theme in his life. About re about religion, Hume said. The whole is a riddle, an enigma, an inexplainable mystery. Doubt, uncertainty, suspense of judgment appear the only result of our most accurate scrutiny concerning the subject. However, Hume did not suspend his judgment concerning the religion. He argued that, that religion was both irrational and impractical. So for him... In the first place, fear of God and the expectation of an afterlife have less day-to-day -day effect upon the conduct than is generally supposed. In the second place, religions do positive harm. They invent mortal sins like suicide, which have no natural depravity, and they create uh, frivolous uh, merits which partake in no natural good, like abstaining from certain foods or attending ceremonies. Moreover, religions result in cruel perse persecutions, bigotry, strife uh, between sects or between sects and the civil power, and the hunting down of unorthodox opinions. Rather than becoming involved in the uh, sometimes furious quarrels over religious beliefs, Hume sought refuge in the calm tough obscure regions of philosophy so towards the end of his life hume left the uh, the manuscript of his dialogues concerning natural religion with his friend the famous economist adam smith with the understanding that smith might the uh, that smith would arrange for its publication however when hume died in 1776 
Smith, perhaps fearing reprisal against him, against himself, advised against the publication of the book. It did not appear until 1779 and then without the publisher's name on it. For Hume's goal, according to Hume, it is evident that all the sciences and have a relation greater or less to human nature, and that, however wide any of them may seem to run from it, they still return back by one passage or another. Under the heading of science, Hume included such uh, topics as mathematics, natural philosophy, or uh, the physical science, religion, logic, morals, criticisms, and politics. In other words, all important matters reflect human nature, the understanding that nature is therefore essential. In developing his science of man, Hume followed in the empirical tradition of Occam, Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, and uh, Berkeley. As the science of man is the only solid foundation for the other sciences, so the only solid foundation we can give to the science itself must be laid on experience and observation. That was what he said. Hume, however, was very impressed with the achievements of Newtonian science, and he wanted to do for, uh, and he wanted to do for moral philosophy what Newton had done for natural philosophy. Hume believed that he could bring about a reform in moral philosophy comparable to the Newtonian revolution in physics by following the every method of inquiry that Newton had followed. He aspired to be the Newton of the moral science. His achievement would in fact surpass Newton's. The science of man is not only the dis indispensable foundation of natural philosophy, but is also of greater uh, importance and much superior in uh, utility. In Hume's day, moral philosophy yeah, referred to uh, in Hume's day, moral philosophy referred to uh, what we now call the social sciences and the uh, Natural philosophy referred to what we now call the physical sciences. Besides being an empirical science, the science of man would also be an experimental science. Because experiments are so uh, useful in the physical sciences, they would also be used in the science of man. However, Hume did not employ experiments by his science in his science of man the same way that they were employed in a physical scientist. For the physical scientist, an experiment involved purposely ma manipulating some environmental variables and uh, noting the effect of that manipulation on, an on another variable. Both variables were observable and measurable. As we will see, the major determinants of behavior in Hume's systems were cognitive and not directly observable. For Hume, the term experience meant cognitive experience. What uh, then could be could the term experience mean to Hume? By experiment, I should say, what then could the experiment okay, mean to Hume? By experiment, Hume meant careful observation of how experiences are related to one another and how experience is related to behavior. Hume noted that this experimental science of human nature would be different from the physical sciences. But different did not mean inferior. Okay? In fact, his science might even be superior to the other sciences. Now, Hume's goal then was to combine the empirical philosophy of the his predecessors with the principles of Newtonian science and in the process create a science of human nature. It is ironic that with all of Hume's admiration for Newton, Hume tended to use the Baconian inductive method more than the Newtonian deductive method. The major thrust in Hume's approach was to make careful observations and then careful, uh, gen carefully generalize from those observations. Hume occasionally did formulate a hypothesis and test it against ex experience, but his emphasis was clearly on uh, the induction rather than the deduction. Moving on, we have impressions and ideas. Like empiricists that preceded him, Hume believed that the contents of the mind came from experience. Also, like this predecessor, he believed that experience or the perception could be stimulated by either internal or external events. Hume agreed with Berkeley that we never experience the physical directly and can have only perceptions of it.
Hume did not deny the existence of physical reality. He actually denied only the possibility of knowing it directly. Although the ultimate nature of physical reality must be necessary, must necessarily remain obscure, its existence, according to Hume, must be assumed in all rational deliberations. So, for him, or according to him, it is in vain to ask whether there be body or not. That is a point which we must take for granted in all our reasonings. Hume distinguished between impressions, which were strong, vivid perceptions, and ideas, which are relatively weak perceptions. All the perceptions of the human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, which I shall call, which he called impressions and ideas. The difference between this consists in the degrees of form, of force, and liveliness with which they strike upon the mind and make their way into the thought or consciousness. Those perceptions which enter with most force and violence we may name impressions, and under this name, a, 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 he comprehended all uh, our, our sensations, passions, and emotions as they make their first appearance in the soul. By ideas, he meant the faint images of uh, this thinking and reasoning. Next, we have simple and complex ideas and the imagination. Hume made the same distinction that Locke made between simple ideas and complex ideas. Although, according to Hume, all simple ideas were once impressions, not all complex ideas necessarily correspond to complex impressions. Once ideas exist in the mind, they can be rearranged in an almost infinite numbers of way by the imagination. So, for him, nothing is more, uh, more than uh, the imagination of man. And though it cannot exceed that original stock of ideas, Furnished by the internal and external scenes, senses, it has unlimited power of mixing, compounding, separating, and uh, dividing these ideas in all the varieties of fiction and vision. It can feign a, a train of events with all the appearance of reality, ascribe to them a particular time and place, conceive them as uh, existent, and uh, aside from that, uh, and paint them out to itself with every circumstance that belongs to an historical fact, which it believes with the greatest certainty, wherein, therefore, consists a difference between such a fiction and belief. So it lies not merely in any per peculiar, peculiar idea which is annexed to such a conception as commands our assent, and which is wanting to every known fiction for as the mind has authority over all its ideas it could voluntarily annex this particular idea to any fiction and consequently be able to believe that uh, whatever it uh, be able to believe whatever it pleases contrary to what we find by daily experience we can in our conception join the head of a man to the body of uh, a horse but it is not in the power to believe that such an animal has ever really existed. So it is interesting to note that for Hume, the only difference between fact and fiction is the different feelings an experience produces. An experience produces. Ideas that have been consistently experienced together create the belief that one will follow the other. Such beliefs for us constitute reality. So ideas simply implored by the imagination do not have a history of uh, uh, concordance and uh, therefore they do not elicit a strong belief that one belongs to the other. So let's say for example a blue banana. What distinguishes fact from fantasy then is the degree of belief that one, uh, that one idea belongs with another. And such beliefs is determined by only experience. So again, the contents of the mind come only from experience, but, but once in the mind, ideas can be rearranged at will. Therefore, we can ponder thoughts uh, that do not necessarily correspond to reality. Hume gave the idea of God as an example. So the idea of God as meaning of infinitely intelligent, wise, and good being arises from reflecting on the uh, uh, reflecting on the operations of our mind, of 
our own mind and augmenting without limit those qualities of goodness and wisdom. So, to understand Hume, it is important to uh, remember that all human knowledge is uh, based on simple impressions and Hume stated this fact in the form of a general proposition. So, he said that all our simple ideas in their, in their first appearance are derived from simple impressions, which are correspondent to them and which they exactly represent. Moving forward, we have the association of ideas. So, if ideas were combined only with the imagination, they would be loose and unconnected. The chance alone would join them together. So also the association among ideas would be different from each for each person because there would be no reason for them to be similar. Hume, however, observed that this was not the case. Rather, a great deal of similarity exists among the association of all humans, and this similarity must exp must be explained. Hume considered this account, his account of the association of ideas, as one of his greatest achievements. So according to him. If anything can entitle the author to so glorious a name as that of an inventor, it is the use he makes of the principle of association of ideas which enters into most of his philosophy. So Hume seems to have overlooked the fact that the laws of association go back at least as far as Aristotle and they were employed by Hobbes to a lesser extent by Locke and extensively by Berkeley. So it is true, however, that Hume depended on the principles of association to the point where his philosophy can be said to exemplify associ associationism. So for Hume, the laws of association do not cement ideas together so that their uh, association becomes immutable. As we have already seen, the imagination can reform the ideas in the mind into almost any configuration. So rather, Hume saw the laws of association as a gentle force which creates certain associations as opposed to others. So Hume discussed the laws of association that influence our thoughts. So we have the law of resemblance. The law of resemblance states that our thoughts run easily from one idea to another. So such as when uh, thinking one of uh, uh, thinking of one friend stimulates the recollection of other friends. Next is we have the law of contiguity. Okay, contiguity states that when one thinks of an object, there is a tendency to recall other objects that were experienced at the same time and place as the object being pondered, such as when remembering a gift stimulates thoughts of uh, the giver. Okay. And lastly, we have the law of cause and effect. So the, the law of cause and effect states that when we think of an outcome or of, or of an effect, we tend to also think of the events that typically precede that outcome, such as when we see lightning and consequently, of course, we think of thunder. According to Hume, there is no relation uh, which produces a stronger connection in the fancy and, w and makes one idea more readily recall another. Then the relation of uh, cause and, and effect between and their objects. So because Hume considered cause and effect to be the most important law of association, we will examine it more in detail. Okay, so let's proceed to analysis of causation. So from the time of Aristotle through uh, scholasticism and to the science of Hume's day, it was believed that certain causes by their very nature produce certain effects. To make the statement A causes B, okay, was to state something of the essence of A and B. That is, uh, there was assumed to be natural relation between the two events so that knowing A would allow for the prediction of B. So this prediction could be made from knowing the essences of A and B without having observed the two events together. Hume completely disagreed with this analysis of causation. For him, we can never know that two events occur together unless we have experienced them occurring together. In fact, for Hume, a causal relationship is consistently observed relationship and nothing more. Causation then 
is not a logical necessity. It is a psychological experience. It was not Hume's intention to deny the existence of causal relationship and thereby undermine science, which searches for them. Rather, Hume attempted to specify what it, uh, what it means okay, by a causal relationships and how, and how beliefs in such relationship, relationships develop. Hume described the observations that need to be made in order to conclude that the two events are causal, causally related. So, we have first one, the cause and effect must be conti uh, contiguous okay, in space and time. The cause must be prior to the effect and there must be a constant union between the cause and then the effect. It is chiefly this quality that uh, uh, constitutes the relation. And then we have the same cause always produces the same effect. Okay? And the same effect never arises from the same cause. Thus, it is on the basis of consistent observations that causal inferences are drawn. Predictions based on such observations assume that what happened in the past will continue to happen in the future. But there is no guarantee that being a uh, guarantee of that being in being the case. What we operate with this is the belief that relationships observed in the past will continue to exist in the future. And such a belief is accepted in faith alone. So also, even if all conditions listed above are met, we could still be incorrect okay, in drawing the causal inference. Such as when we conclude that the sunset causes the sunrise because one always precedes the other and the one never occurs without the other first occurring. So according to Hume then, it is not rationality that allows us to live effective lives. It is cumulative experience or what, what Hume called the custom. Okay? So according to, to Hume, custom is the great guide of human life. It is that principle alone which uh, renders our experience useful to us and makes us expect for the future a similar train of events with those which have appeared in the past so with the influence of custom we should uh, be entirely ignorant of every matter of fact be beyond what is immediately pre present to the memory of s and senses so we should never know how to adjust means to ends or to employ our natural powers in the production of uh, any effect so there would be an end at the ones of all action as well as the chief part of speculation. Now let us tackle the analysis of the mind and the self. So as mentioned before, a persistent problem throughout psychology's history has been to account for the unity of experience. Although we are confronted with a myriad of changing situations, our experience situ maintains a continuity over time and across conditions. So the entities that most often have been postulated to explain the unity of experience are a mind or a self. So it was a significant event in uh, psychology's history. So then when Hume claimed that uh, there is neither a mind or a self, all beliefs according to Hume result from recurring experiences and are explained by the laws of association so all metaphor metaphysical entities such as god soul and matter are products of the imagination as uh, as are the so-called laws of nature hume extended his uh, skepticism to include the concept of mind that was so important to many philosophers in including descartes Locke, and berkeley so according to hume the mind is no more than the perceptions we are having at any given moment. So we may be we may observe what that what we call a mind is nothing but a heap or collection of different perceptions united together by certain relations and supposed the falsely to be endowed with a perfect simplicity and identity. So just as there is no uh, mind independent and perceptions there is also no self independent of perceptions so uh, for him and when he entered or when an individual entered most intimately into what they call self myself and 
they always stumble on the particular perception of others. So, of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. So, someone can uh, never can catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. So, when the perception are removed from any time as by sound, sleep, lo as so long as uh, that individual insen is insensible of myself, yeah. And may truly be said not to exist, and were all my, uh, and were all his or her perceptions removed by death, and could his or her neither think nor feel nor see nor love nor hate after the dissolution of he, that individual's body should be entirely annihilated. Okay, so moving forward, we have the ma the passions or emotions as the ultimate determinants of behavior. So Hume pointed out that through human history, humans have had the same passions and that these passions have motivated similar behaviors. It is universally acknowledged that there is a great uniformity among the actions of men in all nations and ages and that human nature remains uh, still the same. Okay, in its... Uh, principles yeah, and operations so the same motives always produce the same actions the same events follow from the same causes ambition avarice uh, self-love vanity friendship generosity public spirit these passions mixed with various degrees and distributed through societies have been from the beginning of the world and still are the source of all the actions and the enterpri enterprises which have ever been observed among mankind hume noted that um, even though all human po all human possess the same passion they do not do so in the same degree and because different individuals possess different degree or different patterns of passions they will respond differently to situations so the pattern of passions that a person possess determines his or her character and it is character that determines behavior it is a person's character that allows for his or her consistent interaction with people it is through individual experience that certain impressions and ideas become associated with certain emotions and it is the passion elicited by these impressions and ideas however that will determine one's behavior so this is another application of the laws of association only in this case, the association are between various experiences and passions or emotions and between passions and emotions uh, and between passions and behavior. So in general, we can uh, say that individuals will seek experiences associated with pleasure and avoid experiences associated with pain. And the fact that human behavior is at times inconsistent does not mean that it is free any more than the weather, big, sometimes unpredictable, means that the weather is free. Okay, so the internal principle of motives may operate in a uniform matter, not with, notwithstanding the seeming irreg irregularities in the same manner as the winds, rains, clouds, and other variations of the weather are supposed to be governed by steady principles. So, though not easily discover discoverable by humans' sagacity and uh, inquiry. Okay? And then, aside from that, Human learns how to act in different circumstances the same way that non-human animals do. So through the experience of reward and punishment in both cases, reasoning ability has nothing to do with it. And then aside from that, so this is... Uh, Alright, so... This is evident from the effects of discipline and education on animals who, by the proper application of rewards and banishment, may be taught any course of action. So the most contrary to, the, to their natural instincts and propensities. It is not experience which renders the dog apprehensive of pain when you menace him or lift up the whip to beat him. Is it not even experience 
which makes him answer to his name and infer from such an arbitrary sound that you mean that you mean him rather than any of his fellows and intend to call him when you pronounce it in a certain manner and with a certain tone and accent okay animals therefore are not guided in this in inferences by reasoning neither are children Neither are the um, generality of mankind in the ordinary actions of in their ordinary actions and conclusions. Neither are the philosophers themselves, who in all the active parts of life are in the main, the same with the vulgar and the govern by the same um, maxims. It is not ideas and impressions that causes behavior. But the passions associated with those ideas or impressions. So it is not this reason that Hume said we speak. It is for this reason that Hume said we speak not strictly and philosophically when we talk to the combat of passion and reason. Reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passion, and can never be can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Now, lastly, for David Hume. Hume's influence. So Hume, was, Hume vastly increased the importance of what we now call psychology. So in fact, he reduced philosoph philosophy, religion, and science to psychology. Everything that humans know is learned from experiences, and all beliefs are simply expectations that events uh, that have been correlated in the past will remain correlated in the future. So such beliefs are not rationally determined nor can they be rationally defended so the result from experience and we can have faith only that what we learn from experience will be applicable to the future according to hume then humans can be certain for of nothing it is for this reason that hume is sometimes referred to as the supreme skeptic so hume accepted only two types of knowledge First one is the demonstrative and empirical. Demonstrative knowledge relates to ideas such as the mathematics, such as such knowledge is true only by accepted definition and does not necessarily say anything about facts or objects outside the mind. Uh, demonstrative knowledge is entirely abstract and entirely the product of imagination. This is not to say that demonstrative knowledge is useless because the relations the relations gleaned in arithmetic algebra and geometry are of this type of rep, uh, of this type and represent clear and precise thinking such knowledge however is based entirely on deduction form uh, deduction from one idea to another so therefore it does not necessarily say anything about empirical events Okay. On the other hand, empirical knowledge is based on experience, and it alone can furnish knowledge that can effectively guide our conduct in the world. So according to Hume, for knowledge to be useful, it must be either demonstrative or empirical. It is neither, if it is neither, it is not real knowledge, and therefore, it is considered as useless. Okay, so next, yeah. Hume's insistence that all propositions must be er, must be either demonstrably or empirically true places him clearly in the positive positivistic tradition of Bacon. So we will have more to say about positivity positivism. Okay, soon when uh, the reporters will uh, present that topic now next we have david hartley david hartley is the son of a clergyman so and uh, he had completed his training as a minister at the university of cambridge before an interest in biology caused him to seek a career as a physician hartley remained deeply religious all his life believing that understanding natural phenomena increased one's faith in God. So it took several years for Hartley to write his long and difficult observations on man, his frame, his duty, and his expectation that was in 1749. His ponderous book is divided into two parts. So the first part, uh, concerning the human frame, contains 
his uh, contributions to psychology. And then the second is almost uh, totally theological. So the second part concerning the duty and expectations of humans. So Hartley's goal, so although Hartley's observations appeared several years after Hume's treatise on human nature, that was uh, in uh, 1739 to 1740. Hartley had been uh, working on his book for many years and appears not to have been influenced by Hume. So his two major influences were Locke and Newton. Hartley accepted Newton's contention that never that nerves are solid, okay, so not hollow as uh, Descartes had believed, and that sensory experience. Caused by, uh, caused by vibrations in the nerves. So these vibrations were called impressions. The impressions reach the brain and cause vibrations in the infinitesimal medullary particles, which causes sensations. So Newton had also observed that vibrations in the brain show a certain inertia. That is, they continue vibrating after the impressions causing them or causing them cease. So this, according to Newton, was why we, a whirling piece of coal as a circle of light, okay, for Hartley, it was the lingering vibrations in the brain, okay, following a sensation that constituted ideas. Ideas then were faint replications of uh, sensations. So Hartley's goal was to synthesize Newton's conception of nerve transmission by, vi by vibration with previous versions of empiricism, especially uh, in the part of Locke. Okay, so shall we, shall we move to Hartley's explanation of association? So as we have seen, Hartley believed that the sense uh, that sense impressions produced vibrations in the nerves which traveled to the brain and caused similar vibrations in the medullary substance of the brain. So the brain vibrations caused by senses or by sense impressions give rise to uh, uh, give rise to sensations. So after sense impressions cease, they remain in the brain or they remain in the brain diminutive okay, vibrations that Hartley called vibration calls so it is the vibra vibration calls that correspond to ideas ideas then are weaker copies of sensations so vibration calls are like the brain vibrations associated with sensations in every way except okay, the vibration calls are weaker so so much for how sense uh, so much for how sense impressions cause ideas now the question is, how do ideas become associated? So, in any sensations, say for example, A, B, C, etc., by being associated with one another, a sufficient number of times gets such a power over the corresponding idea. So we have a small letter A, B, C, etc., that any one of the sensations A, when impressed alone, shall be able to excite in the mind. Okay, so B, C, etc., the ideas of the rest. So Hartley's notion that experience consistently occurring together are recorded in the brain as an interrelated package and that experiencing one element in the package will make one conscious of the entire package is remarkably modern. So we, we although, although Hartley distinguished between simultaneous and successive associations both are examples of law of con contiguity okay so successive experience follow each other close in time and simultaneous events occur at the same time so both exemplify a type of contiguity as with most accounts of association then the law of contiguity was at the heart of Hartley's what made Hartley's account of association significantly different from previous accounts was his attempt to correlate all mental activity with neurophysiological uh, activity. Okay, now let us move to simple and complex ideas under David Hartley. Unlike Locke, who believed that complex ideas are formed from simple ideas via reflection, Hartley, on the other hand, believed that all complex ideas are formed automatically by the process of association. So for Hartley, there were no active mind processes involved at all. 
Simple ideas that are associated by contiguity form complex ideas. Similarly, complex ideas that are associated by contiguity become associated into the complex ideas. As simple ideas combine into complex ideas and complex ideas combine to form the complex, I the complex ideas, it may be difficult to remember the individual sensations that make up each ideas. However, for hardly all ideas, no matter how complex, are made up of sensations. Furthermore, association is the only process responsible for converting simple ideas into complex ideas. Following the simple and complex ideas, we have the laws of association applied to behavior. So Hartley attem attempted to show that so-called voluntary behavior developed from involuntary or reflexive behavior. So he used the law of association to explain how involuntary behavior gradually becomes voluntary and then becomes almost involuntary or automatic again. Okay, Involuntary behavior occurs automatically or reflexively in response to sensory stimulation. Voluntary behavior occurs in response to one's ideas or to stimuli not originally associated with the behavior. And voluntary behavior itself can become so habitual that it too, that it too becomes automatic. So not unlike the involuntary behavior. So the basic assumption in Hartley's explanation is that all behavior is at first involuntary and gradually becomes voluntary through the process of association. So we have an example here where, and we can see that Hartley's explanation of the development of voluntary behavior comes very close to what was later called the conditioned reflex. So the fingers of young children bend upon almost every impression which is made upon the palm of the hand. So thus performing the action of grasping in the original automatic manner. After a sufficient repetition of the motor vibrations which occur in this action, this, their vibra vibrationcles okay, are generated and associated strongly in other vibrations or vibrationcles. The most common of which is, is uh, are the... Uh, are those excited by the by the sight of a favorite plaything which the which the child uses to grasp and hold in his hand so for for Hartley he ought therefore according to the doctrine of association to perform and repeat the association of grasping upon having such a plaything presented in his sight but it is a known fact that children do this so by pursuing the same method of reasoning we may see how, uh, after a sufficient uh, repetition of the proper associations, the sound of the word grass, take hold, etc., the sight of nurse's hand in the state of contraction, the idea of a hand, and particularly of the child's own hand, in the state and innumerable other associated circumstances, for example, sensations, ideas, and motions, will put the child upon grasping. Uh, Till at last the idea or state of mind which we may call the will to grasp okay, is generated and sufficiently associated with the action to to uh, pro to produce it instantaneously so it is therefore perfectly voluntary in this case and uh, by the innumerable repetitions of it in uh, this perfectly voluntary state it comes at last to obtain a uh, sufficient connection with so many diminutive sensations, ideas, and uh, motions as to follow them in the same manner as originally automatic actions do uh, the corresponding sensations. And consequently, to be, to be automatic secondarily, and in the same manner, may all the actions performed with the hands be explained. All those that are very familiar in life passing from the original automatic state through the several degrees of voluntariness till they become perfectly voluntary and then repassing okay, through the same degrees in an inverted order till they become secondarily autom automatic on many occasions though still perfectly voluntary on some viz uh, when uh, when some when so ever okay an express act of the will is exerted so thus uh, behavior if first involuntary 
Okay, and then it becomes increasingly uh, it becomes increasingly voluntary as uh, through as through the process of association. So more and more stimuli come capable of eliciting the behaviors. Finally, when performing the voluntary action becomes habitual, it is said to be secondary automatically or secondarily automatic. So it should be clear that Harley did not employ the term voluntary to mean freely chosen. For him, voluntary behavior is determined by the law of contiguity and therefore, no free choices is involved. And Hartley's effort to explain <coughs> the relationship between ideas and behavior was rare among philosophers of his time and practically unheard of before his time. So we see in Hartley's explanation much that would later become part of modern learning theory. So the importance of emotion... In general, Hartley believed that excessive vibrations cause the experience of pain and that mild or moderate vibration cause the experience of pleasure. So again, association plays a prominent role in Hartley's analysis. So through experience, certain objects, events, and people become associated with pain and others with pleasure. So we learn to love the desire and desire those things that give us pleasure. Hope for them when... Uh, they are absent and experience joy when they are present. So similarly, we learn to hate and avoid those things that give us pain. Fear their eventuality and experience grief when they are present. So it was Hartley's disi disi disciple, yeah, Joseph Priestley, famous co chemist and co-discoverer of oxygen, who explored the implications of Hartley's analysis of emotions for education. And yeah, so he... Priestley and also wrote Hartley's theory of the human mind on the principle of the association of ideas, which did, which did much to promote the popularity of Hartley's idea. And lastly, yeah, we have Hartley's influence. So Hartley took the speculations concerning neurophysiology for his time and used them in his analysis of association. So his effort was the first major attempt to explain the neurophysiology of thought and behavior since Descartes. So the neurophysiological mechanisms that Hartley postulated were largely fictitious, but as more become known about neutral transmission and brain mechanism, the more accurate information replaced the older information. So, thus, Hartley started the search for the biological correlates of mental events that has continued in the present. So, earlier, associationism was defined as... Uh, and uh, any phys physiological or psychological theory that has association as its fundamental principle. So under this definition, neither Hobbes nor Locke's philosophy is qualified. So Hume probably qualifies, but Hartley was the first man to whom the term associationists can be applied without qualification. So Hartley's brand of associ associationism became highly influential and was the authoritative account for about 80 years or until the time of James Mill.